Hello, this is Tali Perlman. You might be surprised to hear my voice, a divergence from your usual host, Alex Trembath. Don't worry, he's sitting right across from me. I'm a producer of the show and Breakthrough's digital communications manager, and today I'm excited to flip the tables and get Alex on the interviewee side of our conversation. For the last few weeks, we've been gathering questions from you, our loyal audience, and today we're thrilled to host our very first AMA episode, Ask Me Anything. Your questions challenged and provoked us, and today we're going to parse through them in an informal discussion. One of the things we're most proud of at Breakthrough and deeply enjoy doing is hosting our biannual conferences, the Breakthrough Dialogues on the West Coast in the summer and Eco-Modernism outside DC in the fall. But these are a cumulative six days of the year. One of our goals in starting this podcast, which is now 27 episodes deep, was to expand those conversations beyond a limited audience and limited days. In our last episode, we spoke with Jacqueline Gill, who started Warm Regards, which was one of the first climate podcasts and really a pioneer of its time. Her justification for podcasting on issues in climate, food, energy, and the like inspired us. She argued that this medium is less constrained and less polarizing than others, like social media or long-form essays. It leaves space for the messiness that makes conversations productive and allows for more of a two-way street, the way good communication should and must do. Today's episode is one way we're hoping to honor that, valuing listening above anything else and inviting you, our listeners, into the room with us. We'll be chatting about everything from climate denialism to electric scooters to whether eco-modernism is even a useful label. Hope you enjoy. With that, I'm excited to, for the first time, welcome Alex to the show. Alex, thanks for joining me. Tali, I am thrilled to be here. Yeah, this has been a long time coming. I'm really excited we're doing this. Yeah, this was this is a great idea. I'm a, I'm honestly a little nervous having having done like you said 27 of these. I, I feel like I've gotten a little used to it, but on on your side of the table. So now I'm I'm a little jittery. <laughs> I am too. Um, so let's just jump right in. Um, we got a bunch of really good questions. So and I want to make sure we can get through as many of them as we have time for. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Gus. He asks. Can you think of a specific area of technology that you think is lacking in engineering talent or innovation rather than just, say, government funding or public acceptance? Yeah, I, I think this is a great question, and it's it's one that I've heard in various forms over the years. And and sort of my, my reaction was to, was to think that, take, for example, the electricity sector, uh, which is responsible for something like a fifth of global emissions. And is sort of is nowhere near deep decarbonization or on path towards deep decarbonization this century at the paces we think are necessary. But if you look around, there are a number of workable solutions, at least workable up to a point. You have we have uh, nuclear reactors, both sort of conventional and, and a set of advanced reactors coming on board. We have renewable energy technologies like solar and wind. We have batteries for daily electricity storage. We we have some early demonstrations of carbon capture technologies and other things like hydro and geothermal and things like that. So you put that all together and you can at least imagine a pretty deeply decarbonized electricity sector, especially with continued innovation around seasonal storage, advanced nuclear and things like that. That's not to say that that problem is solved, far from it. But it is to say that if you look outside electricity, there are answers sort of fewer and far farther afield. So you look at industrial processes like glass, steel and cement production. We just don't know at scale, how to produce those commodities without fossil fuels. We don't know what the fuel or the prime mover is going to be that isn't coal or natural gas or or whatever is powering those industries today. You look at uh, the transportation sector, you look at things like aviation and heavy shipping, and there are some, uh, there's some speculative ideas out there uh, in terms of drop-in fuels or, uh, or, or new technologies that run, run on different fuels for, uh, for heavy transportation. But as far as I'm able to tell, we don't really know how to scale those at all. We, have, we haven't sort of picked or, under, or the technology hasn't picked itself or however you want to think about it. And we're nowhere near towards developing the or sort of accelerating the radical infrastructure and technology changeover that would that would be necessitated by that. Uh, and then you look at you look at things like farming, you look at things like nitrogen in uh, in global agriculture, both nitrogen emissions into the atmosphere from food production and nitrogen runoff into groundwater and soils. 
Um, there, again, there are some options in terms of technologies, practices, fertilizers, um, but we still see significant nitrogen, pro nitrogen emissions and nitrogen pollution problems with the technologies that we have available today. Um, and not a lot in the way of really simple technical or even practical solutions. Um, and so that, that's my, that's my basic answer is that electricity is really hard. Um, and I'm, would encourage anyone to get involved in uh, either research or engineering or policy advocacy to accelerate deep decarbonization and innovation in the electricity sector. But there is a sort of disproportionate lack of, uh, of, of research funding, of uh, engineering activity, of policy advocacy and understanding in almost every other sector of the economy. Hmm. Yeah, Gus says that he's a mid-20s ambitious and optimistic engineer. So if he's listening to this, now he has a lot of ideas of where he can dive in. Hopefully, and hopefully there are more people like Gus out there. Yeah, uh, I wanted to dive in a little bit more on your uh, note about aviation. Um, I was reading this report from Rhodium that said that uh, the trans so right now the transportation sector is the number one source of emissions in the U.S., um, but that it's predicted that the power sector will overtake it by 2020, mostly because of improvements in uh, passenger vehicles from MPG efficiency improvements, things like that, uh, more electric vehicles. Um, but that there's really been almost no improvement at all in trucking and large scale aviation. So I was just, I mean, this is a bigger question about innovation in general, which is like, why isn't there more innovation happening here in a field that so many people use and would make such a big impact? There are so many answers to that question, one of which is sort of technological inertia, one of which is a lack of research funding, which we were just talking about. But what I always come back to is something that people don't admit or don't talk about enough, which is that fossil fuels are super useful. They're super abundant. They're all over the place. They are super transportable, super storable, and super useful. Like we, we literally light them on fire around our campgrounds and we put them into 787s and fly around the world in them. And they're just very difficult to displace from uh, an energy density, storability, transportability perspective in ways that I don't think we admit to ourselves because we want to at least think ambitiously and optimistically that deep decarbonization and climate action is going to be technically easier than it actually is. And, you know, again, the, the progress in electricity, I think, is laudable, obviously, and encouraging, but might even give us uh, sort of too rosy a picture of how easy it'll be to develop, deploy, and innovate in technologies outside the electricity sector uh, that require, you know, liquid fuels that require really high energy densities uh, that require storability and transportability in, in, in a way that sort of building and, and residential electricity don't. Um, so again, there's, you know, I could go on and on about the, the lack of innovation, uh, the, the lack of understanding and prioritization around innovation investments and, uh, socio-technical uh, innovation systems uh, that include demonstration, deployment, diffusion. There, you know, I could go on and on ab about innovation systems and, and how they are flawed and how they could be improved. But I think the baseline consideration has to be an understanding that fossil fuels are super cheap, they're super available, and they're super useful. And if we're not honest about that, then we are setting ourse ourselves up for failure. Yeah, I think that's a really crucial point and worth repeating. Um, one of our most recent journal essays by John Simmons um, wrote explicitly about this, about how um, Greta Thunberg's environmentalism is very different than like Naomi Klein's environmentalism. And the one big difference there is really just the acknowledgement that fossil fuels run our world and they've been really awesome and productive in a lot of ways. Like they've allowed us to travel and have efficient energy in all of our homes and, you know, like have a higher standard of living. Um, and that acknowledgement, uh, and noting the value of fossil fuels is really, really crucial for us to move forward and start to think about how we might build a cleaner world, but with the same standard of living. Yeah. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about this other stuff later. I have plenty of time for arguments about climate denial and about, fossil fuel companies not being always active partners in the push for innovation and decarbonization. Um, but I think without that point that you just made, that the that these fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas mostly, have been super useful to society and have actually been nature-saving in a bunch of ways. Coal saved the forests and oil saved the whales. We can get into why those are complicated another time. Um, but if we don't sort of start from that premise, then I think we're telling ourselves a story 
uh, about how climate action is easier than it will in fact be. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but <laughs> a long, a long slog that's definitely worth <laughs> worth pursuing. Um, so speaking of which, um, I want to get into the next question, which is from uh, the perfect norm on Twitter. Um, he asked, uh, is Yang's climate plan worth a damn? And I think this is a good question as we're sort of getting closer to the next presidential election. Um, let's talk in general about how helpful or good or indicative these climate plans that are coming now from presidential hopefuls are. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a great question. Um, you know, Breakthrough is a policy facing organization. We want to influence policy. And there is a surprising amount of talk about climate and energy policy happening right now. I wouldn't have predicted this a year ago. And that's that's seen in the Democratic presidential debates and, and in the and the plans that the candidates are releasing. Um, so I, I don't know them nearly as well as, for instance, you see Santa Barbara's Leah Stokes, who is the resident expert on all things Democratic climate agenda. And you should you should look into her tweets and, and her writing on that if you want to get into more more of the weeds. Um, having looked at all of them in some capacity, including Andrew Yang's, uh, you know, starting with with Yang's, you know, it's I would say that it's a very technologically inclusive and pretty expansive and ambitious agenda for dealing with climate change over the next three, four decades or more. We're, we're talking uh, about a technologically inclusive decarbonization and mitigation plan that includes things like renewables and electric vehicles, but also things like nuclear power, advanced reactors, um, carbon capture, direct air capture, and things like that. Uh, Yang, almost more than the other candidates, I think, also takes adaptation to things like sea level rise uh, uh, and impacts on crops very seriously. So I, I think um, I, th I think his plan, uh, to the extent that it is a plan, is is pretty good. Uh, it is a pretty good picture of the problem and and opens up uh, a considerable space to talk about solutions. And I think that most of the plans kind of are. You know, we're talking. Uh, not just in a technologically inclusive way about mitigation technologies, not just about the whole problem, talking about adaptation, mitigation, uh, air capture and things like that. But we're talking about the technology specifically. Uh, we're, we're talking about the pathways in ways that we weren't 10 years ago. You know, you can sort of quibble with some of the plans. Bernie Sanders, for instance, shoes carbon capture and nuclear, for instance. And in, in the most recent debate, I think Elizabeth Warren raised a flag about nuclear waste management in ways that I, uh, I again, I could quibble with. Um, but on net, we're talking about climate change as a technological challenge, uh, mostly. We're talking about dealing with the impacts that we've already baked in. Uh, we're not just talking about sort of carbon prices or regulation the way that we were uh, 10, 15 years ago. And so I'm, I'm mostly encouraged by the the sort of shift in the dialogue around climate policy at the at the U.S. federal level. Yeah, it's exciting just the fact that they exist and that they're happening in such a central debate stage. Um, so our next question is from Solomon, who wants to know, what's the real problem current emissions or the greenhouse gases already present in the atmosphere? Yeah, this is a this is a question I've heard before, and I don't fully understand it. I don't know why we have to choose. But to, to take the, the question on its merits, we have been loading the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases for, you know, 200 years, say, but more than that. But, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, for simplicity's sake, and that has caused something like a degree of warming since pre-industrial uh, since the pre-industrial era. Um, and we continue to load the atmosphere with carbon dioxide today. And the, the, the warming that we have produced through historic emissions will have lasting impacts for the coming decades. And every ton of carbon that we put in the atmosphere subsequently will worsen those impacts. Um, that is to say that if we stopped emitting today completely, we would still deal with some sea level rise. We would still deal with some changing weather patterns over the coming decades. Um, that's not a reason to not slow or stop emitting as soon as possible. Um, and, and, you know, the converse is also true. Um, just because, uh, we've already emitted so much, um, doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how much uh, we continue to emit in the future. Um, just because we've baked in a certain amount of warming already doesn't mean that that is the primary concern and our future emissions aren't. Um, so 
the, uh, the the simple answer is to get an uh, is to develop a, a very clear understanding of what the expected local and regional impacts of global warming are uh, expected to be given where we are today and you know the the mission remains as it ever has been to bend the emissions curve down as swiftly and as steeply as possible and i think that's mostly going to be through the innovation and diffusion of cleaner cheaper technologies yeah, that seems to be a recurring theme in climate solutions, basically like widen the toolbox and use everything in it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for for the most part, and you could, you, again, you could sort of quibble around the the edges of of that, um, of that framework, you know, you could have, you could have a conversation about dramatically scaling bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and building like sort of continent sized global production forests to suck up carbon and then burn in power plants. You obviously there are interesting conversations on on the on the margins about rooftop versus commercial versus utility scale solar, for instance, or what types of political economy will support what type of deployment of nuclear reactor. Um, those are interesting debates, uh, but fundamentally, from a gl- sort of a global climate change perspective, uh, the the more tools we have um, to bend that emission curve down, the better, uh, and the better an understanding of uh, expected future climate change, the better prepared we'll be to deal with what we've already guaranteed. Yeah, totally. Um, So our next question is from Edith, and I think it's a question that most people immediately jump to as soon as you start having a conversation about climate change. Um, It's a question about climate denialism. She says, no wonder we make so little progress in dealing with climate change because so many people don't really believe in it. So how big of a problem is climate denialism? Really, should we even be addressing it? Yeah, it, it, this, this is a tough question for me. I think that I am not a climate denier. I, you know, I don't think most people are. Um, uh, the, the science is extremely robust that the earth is warming due to anthropogenic emissions and that that warming will produce negative impacts on humanity and on non-human nature this century and going forward. Um, you know, like the, the challenge with, with climate denialism is figuring out where it comes from. And I think you can make a pretty convincing case that global warming as a problem, as a, as a political and social cultural problem was sort of rolled out onto the stage in the 1988 through the, through the mid to late nineties as a global problem that required a global solution that would be dealt with primarily through the vehicle of the United Nations and the uh, framework convention on climate change through a treaty or a set of treaties, uh, targets and timetables on, on emissions and emissions reductions that would be set by a scientifically advised global government or supra government body. Um, that for whatever it's worth, and y- y- even, uh, sort of assuming for the sake of argument that that is the right way to deal with emissions and climate change, that is not really a way to convince conservatives or hierarchicalists or, uh, or whatever that global warming is a problem worth taking seriously. Um, if the solution you offer is, is one that is sort of highly dependent on global governance and on the, the expertise of scientists and experts, uh, then you should expect some amount of, uh, of sort of political and cultural pushback from people and groups that are not inclined to think that way. Um, it's all sort of water under the bridge at this point. We can't go back in time and advise Jim Hansen and Al Gore and, you know, the Rio 1992 summit to ch- sort of change their messaging. Um, and so what do we do about climate denial today? Um, I think it, it comes back in many ways to disrupting climate and energy politics in ways that make more space for conservatives or libertarians, hierarchicalists and egalitarians to not just find a climate politics and a climate vision for action that appeals to them, but find ways to build bridges a- across uh, a- across those sort of ideological and cultural divisions. Yeah, I took a class with uh, Paul Lucier at Yale on climate communication, and I just keep returning to this phrase over and over. He said that even talking about denialism gives it cultural oxygen um, and that that's not productive. We shouldn't argue about like these facts versus these facts. We should talk about it as individual units of solutions um, instead of this like big sweep- sweeping polarized um, phenomenon. And yeah, I, I often wonder like, what would it have been like if we had never defined it as this global problem? What if it had only ever been these discrete solutions that we talked about? Would would we be in the same position now? Would we be worse off? Yeah, I don't I don't like to sort of look back on 
10, 20, 30 years ago and say, if we had only done it my way, yeah. then we then we would be smooth sailing right now. I I I think that there is always going to be a at least a element of truth to to those arguments, or, or there can be. Um so yes, I think that if we had approached climate change more as a bottom-up technological challenge starting in like the late 80s or early 90s, then we would have made more progress in bending the emissions curve down today. On the other hand, like solar panels were super expensive in 1992. Wind turbines were much more expensive. The idea of batteries uh, was a glint in people's eyes. Um, nuclear technology had already started the its sort of decline from the the heyday of nuclear deployment globally in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so you know there are even challenges to sort of my slash breakthroughs view on climate action. Um, I, I think that we would be better served, particularly today, um, by m- making the sort of case for climate action and policy more dependent on bottom up technological capabilities and innovation. Um, but I don't want to act like this problem was ever easy um, or or that there was always sort of a simple solution to it, whether that be a treaty or a technology or a set of technologies or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. As important as it is to acknowledge that this problem is very bad, it's also important to acknowledge that we have made progress. We have. People, you know, people say that we haven't made progress because emissions are still trending up globally. And that's true. Um, but, you know, solar is way cheaper than it used to be. We've got dozens of companies in North America uh, making their way pretty successfully, I would say, towards uh, d- demonstrating and deploying advanced nuclear reactors. There's really exciting progress in carbon capture technologies. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, about some at least sort of daily and weekly storage technologies. Um, and we're seeing things like electric vehicles and fake meat. And, you know, you add it all up and it's we haven't bent the emission curve down sufficient, sufficiently yet. But we haven't been sitting on our hands either. Um, I think a lot of the reaction that we have failed over the last 30 years comes from the fact that we don't have binding targets or we don't have high carbon taxes. Um, and that and that is what's causing the uh, the emissions of uh, our energy systems and our food systems and more to keep climbing. Um, but maybe those weren't the right levers to pull in the first place and that the technology lever if we, uh, is, is more appropriate and one we actually have seen progress on yet. Is it sufficient? No, but it is one where we actually see progress. Yeah, that seems like a really productive lens to look at this through. Um, like this messy polarization exists. Um, we're in this mess now. Let's look at the ways that we have managed to make progress within that and do more of that in the future. Yeah. And to come back to the, the question on climate denial, you know, denial continues to exist or lukewarmism or whatever form it manifests in. And that, that can be problematic today as as it has been for for a long time but as you and 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 your professor say sort of talking about it is a fun extracurricular activity if you want to stoke the flames of polarization you know you see like democratic politicians in particular using climate denial as a cudgel to drive a wedge between them and their political opponents and i I don't know how to stop that but sort of talking about the science of atmospheric warming doesn't seem to do a whole lot compared to uh, sort of expanding the envelope of technological options or talking to local communities ab- about adapting to climate impacts um, or sort of d- developing new techno- new forms of technologies like small nuclear reactors or, or fake meat that sort of shake up the politics and, and, the, and the cultural symbolism uh, associated with solutions. That, that I think is how you, you kind of move the ball forward. Yeah, I want to bring in this question from Christian um, because it fits in very neatly to the conversation we're having now. Um, he has a question about alarmist opposition to climate. The example he gives is of his cousin who posts on Facebook about wind farms causing illnesses to flying animals. He asks, how do we respond to adamant opponents without being adamant yourself, but still responding appropriately? Yeah, uh, I, I put a lot of thought into this question. Um, I, I can't speak to uh, with any expertise to wind farms causing illness or harm to humans or animals um so i'll I'll try and pivot to another example which is um which is climate catastrophism i think you could you could make a a mirror argument about climate denial actually um 
But there's there's a difficulty in, for instance, responding to, as, as this question implies, radical or, uh, or or sort of very adamant positions. One, one of which that has cropped up in the last six or 12 months is the idea that we have 12 years to deal with climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, that just is not supported by the science. The IPCC says nothing like that. It's a, it's a distortion of uh, various scientific findings about atm- atmospheric thresholds. Um, that leads one to, to say that. And responding to that, I, I think the danger that the questioner points out can make one come across as less concerned about a problem. Uh, if you are responding to a, a really radical argument, um, you might be perceived by that person or by an audience as less concerned about a challenge. So I think the, the, the way that I think about it and the way that I, I try to communicate in engaging with really radical forms of any argument, whether it's denial or catastrophism or whatever, um, is to do so from a position of, of ambition and seriousness, not brushing off uh, a radical argument just like it's annoying me, but in d- doing so that, that in a way that tries to sort of, um, signal a, a seriousness and an ambition uh, about the challenges that we, that we have facing us today. For, you know, for instance, um, I don't think that we only have 12 years to deal with the climate problem and that I don't think we will reduce emissions by 50% globally by 2030. Um, you might say that mine is the less ambitious solution uh, when I say that we'll, it'll take us longer than that to reduce emissions. But I actually don't really accept the premise of, of that. I, I think that when we're, when we're talking about climate action in the 21st century, we're talking about a, a population of, you know, sort of seven going on nine or 10 billion people this century, all working continuously on a multi-generational trajectory to deal with the impacts and sources of climate of climate change. Um, that is a hugely ambitious project. Um, it requires, uh, it, it requires a fortitude. It requires expertise. It requires commitment to accelerating technological innovation. And it requires more than sort of ambitious sounding political rhetoric uh, around uh, a radical framing of problems. Um, so I, I, and I think that matters. I think that matters in the discourse around climate change uh, as uh, as pragmatists who actually do take the problem extremely seriously, we wouldn't be in our jobs if we didn't take the problem very seriously. But also people who want um, to temper the the really sort of radical and unhelpful claims about science or political action or whatever. Yeah, and understanding this opposition as coming from a place of concern, I think, is a pretty fundamental tenant in good climate communication of like acknowledging the personhood and passion of the other person and meeting them there instead of going directly to these um, more polarizing statistics that don't really get at what the real concern, what the real underlying concern is here. Um, this also made me think of something that uh, Jacqueline Gill again said in the last episode about how making these really severe claims also could diminish the authority of the climate movement. Like if we do nothing and it's 12 years from now and yeah, there's a lot of climate impacts happening, but the world is still alive and somewhat thriving, then everyone's going to lose faith in climate scientists. And so, uh, yeah, you don't want to obscure the seriousness of the problem, but you also don't want to obscure the timeline that we have to work on it and give ourselves space to build coalitions and be inclusive and um, ask for local consent and uh, tackle all of the dimensions of this issue. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So next is a little bit more of a meta question. Um, this is from Oliver. Um, and this is really a question for you, Alex. You've been around breakthrough, what, seven? Eight and a half. Eight and a half years. Um, <laughs> who's counting? <laughs> who's counting? <laughs> Definitely not you. So, um, are there any positions that breakthrough has held over the years that you now disagree with? And what have you most changed your mind about since you've been here? This is a phenomenal question. It's so phenomenal that we actually ask this question all the time at our events. And, and how, uh, tell us about a time you change your mind is a question that we ask often in interviews for jobs here at Breakthrough. Um, I can think of a few times, a few instances of changing my time before I got to Breakthrough. It's what led me here, sort of changing my mind uh, about 
climate catastrophism, changing my mind about nuclear power, uh, like a lot of us did on, on our way towards working at the Breakthrough Institute. But that's not the question. The question is, how have I changed my mind since I've been here? And, you know, I could think about it a little bit more, um, and, and maybe I, I will for a future conversation. I can't think of a, a position that I have sort of radically shifted uh, or done a 180 on since starting at Breakthrough. But there are uh, there are two things that come to mind where my thinking has shifted considerably. Uh, and the first is just on renewable energy technologies. Um, you know, I, I started at Breakthrough significantly more pessimistic about the prospects for solar energy in particular than I am today. And part of that is just me following like the technology and the evidence. It's just gotten cheaper faster than I thought it would. I, uh, I've written a lot about this. I continue to think that solar plus wind plus, you know, the whole bucket of renewable energy technologies is not remotely sufficient to the task of deep decarbonization. But I think they'll play a bigger role at a faster pace than I expected, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, the the other thing that comes to mind is is a little bit more upsetting. And it's a it's sort of about the the role of organizations like Breakthrough in the world. Um, I, I have become less confident in the ability of experts and sort of evidence-based research to influence policy and culture in a helpful way. In the sort of age of Brexit and Donald Trump, we, we just, I think, see less influence of scientific research and think tanks than many of us in these positions might have hoped for. Um, part of that is, is probably a good, like, heat check on all of us. You know, I, I don't think that we actually want a sort of national or global technocracy in which Alex Trembath and the eco-modernists at the Breakthrough Institute <laughs> are just sort of designing policy that is then put in a box and then shipped off to the Congress or anything. Um, but it's actually the, the sort of backlash is, is a little bit worse. Um, in, in my opinion, and it, it's not clear that the, it's not clear that the sort of civil society that we have set up in this, in this country and around the world over the last 30, 50 odd years, um, is more or equally as powerful as the sort of cultural and political polarizations that, that are really dominant in the world today. And so, I don't really have uh, a clear view on what that means for breakthrough, for politics, for policy, for my own career, but it is something that I that I am forced to think about. I think we all are. Yeah, just to interject a bit of optimism into this. Maybe it's just that I've been here for so much less time than you, um, and so I still have my rosy-eyed vision, but um, I do think that if you're not trying to convince an entire country, especially one as far flung and diverse as this one, um, it does seem that it trickles up a little bit better uh, to smaller places like states, like California just passed their 100% clean energy standard. And we're seeing a lot of awesome stuff, especially in the Bay Area coming out of innovative startups. So if you, yeah, the, the federal level, is very hard to tackle. Um, and you can't just sort of insert your neat boxes of Alex Trembath policy directly into the Oval Office. Um, but maybe if you're looking a little bit more specific, a little bit more locally, um, the research can get in through the cracks a little better there. Yeah, one thing that many, many people have observed is that there's been like we've been a polarized country for a long time. And what unified us in so many cases throughout history is some kind of external enemy, you know, whether it was the whether it was the Nazis or the Russians in the Cold War um, and that we don't really have one of those right now. Um, and it means that the divisions within the national culture are much more prevalent than they would be if we were fighting a Cold War, if we were fighting a hot war. In a sense, that's a kind of progress, you know, less war in the world, which is actually, you know, empirically observable. There are, you know, sort of less people engaged per capita than really ever before um, around the world um, is a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to sort of fight a Cold War for national unity's sake. Um, on the other hand, it does it does sort of surface the, these tensions and these divisions. Um, but like you say, those those divisions are less prevalent when you're talking about uh, a governor or a mayor than about a president um, or or about national policy. We uh, th this is not to say that there are no problems uh, around factionalism or cultural divisions at the local or regional scale, um, but I think it does matter that at those sort of uh, at those sort of smaller levels uh, that we are talking more about a community that 
lives and breathes and talks amongst itself than at the national level. It's again, it's discouraging because, you know, so much of the history of human progress uh, over the last century or more has been driven not wholly, but in particular uh, by the U.S. federal government investing in technological um, infrastructural change, um, you, you know, roads and railroads, computers and satellites, clean energy technologies and more. Um, there is a role, obviously, for for states and for local investment in those kinds of things. Um, and those investments continue today. You know, we're, federal investment in scientific research and R D and D continues, and it can, like it got boosted in this year's budget. Um, so I, I, I I'm not, I'm not completely pessimistic a, a, about that, um, but I, I do uh, I do sort of wonder where the 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 sort of both political and, and cultural. Um, cooperation is going to come from and how how local or how national that's going to be in the future. So speaking of cultural cooperation, I think you're going to be very excited about this next question. Um, I think you're going to be so excited that it actually might have been a sarcastic question, but I want to ask it anyway, <laughs> because I know you love talking about it. Um, so this was a, a tweet to you from Joseph, and he wants to know, Alex, what are your thoughts on the impossible whopper? Hi, Joe. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that over the last six or 12 months, fake meat or plant-based meat or clean meat or whatever you call it has become a, a particular techno technological and cultural fascination of mine. Um, and I appreciate that Joe asked the question about the impossible Whopper. I, I wrote this essay a couple months ago at one zero at, at medium, uh, about the, the, ava the new availability of fake meat of, of the impossible burger at Burger King and how this had suspiciously turned a bunch of folks who used to be or, 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 or said they were in favor of plant-based meat as an environmental solution, um, into skeptics or, or outright opponents of it. You know, the, the example that I used, was Mark Bittman, who in 2012 wrote a column at the New York Times about how great fake meat was because it was sort of cutting off the middleman between uh, plants and the human diet uh, that was chickens and cows um, and dramatically lowering the environmental impacts in doing so. Um, but then all of a sudden, it's available at White Castle. It's available at Burger King. It's available at Del Taco. Um, you have the CEO of Chipotle coming out and saying that they're not going to serve fake meat beyond impossible or, or any of it because it's all too hyper processed. Um, and it just smacked of an, uh, of a, of a foodie elitism that, that drove me a, a little crazy. Um, you know, uh, when we're, when we're talking about environmental solutions, we can't just be talking about environmental solutions for the elite or for the wealthy or for the environmentally well to do. And I think there's a particular tendency to do that within sort of foodie environmentalism. Uh, and I don't mean uh, to, to denigrate these communities. There's a lot of good work being done on farmers markets, on urban gardens, on cleaning up sort of local food. Um, but these are just not the solutions that are going to scale to feed the planet this century. And we can talk more about the ways that different scales of food production and energy production um, can coexist, and I think they should. Um, but that, but that, all of that is to say that um, if we're if we're talking about a ecologically friendly product, whether it's a solar panel or a nuclear reactor or a, a plant based hamburger, then it can't uh, it can't be appealing only when it's a, it's a niche application, only when it's being served as jardiniere and coxcomb in San Francisco. The point of these technologies is to scale, and that will bring new challenges to our landscapes and to our diets and to our food production systems and to our energy systems and to our cultures. Um, but I, I'm very concerned uh, about the, the sort of elite shift on a bunch of, uh, on a bunch of environmentally friendly technologies like fake meat when these technologies start to scale. That's the whole point. And I don't think we should be elitist about that. Yeah, I'm really glad we're talking about this because I think this opens up a whole can of worms, which is pretty fundamental to climate change and climate solutions. So I actually do want to dive in a little bit more to whether this conventional small is beautiful Alice Waters, Michael Pollan environmentalism can coexist with this eco modernist strain of environmentalism like impossible meat or, you know, advanced nuclear or things like that. Um, do you think this is a, fundamental rupture? Or are these compatible in any way? How do we have to pick one or the other? Or can they coexist? Yeah, what's frustrating to me about the, the Mark Bittman position is that it treats them as incompatible, 
when in fact I think they are compatible. And and you and I know um, this great essay by Emma Maris in a recent issue of the Breakthrough Journal called Interwoven Decoupling, which talks about how different scales and different types of technological approaches to environmental problems or whatever um, can, as she, as Emma says, be interwoven or can exist to get, coexist at different scales. And you know what she's talking about there, and we, we can use food as an example, is uh, is sort of my experience living in the Bay Area, going berry picking in Pescadero or going wine tasting in Sonoma County at these very small scale, often organic or regenerative farms. Um, and that giving me a sense of what food production is like and what food production enables. Um, but also knowing that the bulk of our food comes from large farms and large scale production, often in different continents where it's more efficient to grow tomatoes, um, often in different states where it's more productive to grow grain, uh, often in highly technological livestock productions. And now in highly synthetic food production processes, like with, uh, like with fake meat. Um, I, what, what I appreciate about all those different scales is it gets us talking about what is the value of me going berry picking and what is the value of me eating an impossible Whopper and what is the value of extremely efficient and productive corn f- production in Nebraska. Um, that is, that's a really important conversation and, and there will, there will by, cause no one gets to decide from on high that it's all going to be high efficiency grain and impossible whoppers versus, you know, like very low, uh, you know, sort of ve- very low density and high, highly labor intensive farms all over the place. These systems will by necessity coexist to some degree. And I think we have to be honest about that and, and, and talk about, um, the, the ways that they coexist and, and, and how, and negotiate to what degree are we going to be relying on large systems versus medium or so- smaller size systems? Um, and uh, again, if we're if we're honest about our values and the way that we want to use land to to do that, then I think it's a very interesting and engaging and enlivening conversation. Um, if all of these systems are assumed to be completely incompatible with each other, and you know, a type of food production or energy production, or whatever, um, is assumed to be bad. Prima, prima facie, uh, then that just stops the conversation before it gets going. Yeah, I think that can be frustrating to hear. Like when I first started diving more into the research of these particular solutions, it felt frustrating to me to be like, we can't just implement this one thing, this one easy trick to save the climate. Like that doesn't work. You have to have a very local place-based conversation over and over and over about like, you know, what does this land look like here and what can it produce and what should we put there? Or like, what does this community believe in and what should we put there? And like those things, those place specific things really matter for the kinds of solutions that you implement in those different places. Um, so that's a much harder conversation to have and you can't just pick your one thing and advocate for it. But I think it's also more hopeful and um, more productive because it means that we don't all have to agree. <laughs> we can each pick what works for what place um, and having them enmeshed into this beautiful, diverse web of solutions um, is a much more productive way to go about it. Yeah, certainly, certainly more productive because you're not going to get around politics and culture, no matter what your preferred production scale system or technology. Yeah. And and that's not like a side note, like those are actual factors that we should take into account when we're thinking about what solution we should pick for a specific place. Um, so I, I have another follow-up question on this, um, which is about whether you think these innovative kinds of tech, like the impossible Whopper, um, like, can they be disruptive on their own? How do we implement them? Do we just put them out into the world and then we'll automatically adapt to them? Or do we need institutional or structural support? Like, what is the root of implementing innovation? I think, I think it depends. And there are a couple examples that come to mind. You know, what's interesting about fake meat is that there isn't a lot of policy behind it in contrast to things like solar panels or advanced nuclear reactors in contrast to things like fracking, which had huge amounts of government R and D and deployment policy behind it. Um, fake meat is actually sort of unique in, in the history of potentially groundbreaking disruptive and uh, environmentally technological uh, solutions um, in that 
uh, you know, a couple companies really, you know, you know met, a growing number of companies are experimenting with new ways to combine plants and process plants to make them taste like meat. And I, I think the, I think in that case, it's been a, a really interesting and successful cultural and marketing experiment where you, you know, you start by getting sort of high-end chefs and foodies really excited about this this new environmentally friendly technology by offering it exclusively in high-end restaurants in coastal cities like New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles. And then as the price point comes down um, by design, um, it be, it becomes available to more people and this and this niche exciting product starts to scale more. Um, and we're at the very, very early stage of the S curve on that one. Um, but it's it's been very interesting to watch. Again, the sort of typical model tends to involve some amount of government support uh, in subsidies for deployment of early technology, certainly support for for R D and D. Um, you know, another uh, another good example is the is the electric scooters um, that I continue to find really fascinating, and I, I think we're again at the very early slope of the of the S curve on the e scooters, um, which were interesting. In contrast to the the bike shares that have been in cities like New York and San Francisco for a long time, um, the bike shares which city governments worked with Ford and City and uh, and the bike manufacturers to set up to build corrals and to and to build um, actual sort of uh, systems and, and 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 policies around where these bikes get deployed. Um, the scooter companies just showed up in San Francisco one day and dropped a bunch of scooters all over the place and and yeah. Uh, thousands in uh, in places like uh, in Oakland and San Francisco and Los Angeles and DC, um, and then just waited to see what happened. And now some cities, San Francisco, for instance, took permits away from Lime and Bird, but gave permits to other companies. Cities are now talking about uh, dedicating parking spaces to keeping those scooters uh, in- instead of the scooters just ending up wherever on the sidewalk or being thrown into the San Francisco Bay or whatever. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's interesting to see how innovation unfolds uh, in, in different ways and at different scales with uh, with the with the with the scooters. It's it's very sort of bottom up. Um, it's, it's very messy. But we see how social co- sociocultural systems adapt around these these new technologies and these new ways of getting around, um, particularly when those um, when those really do disrupt uh, both our, our sort of sidewalks and our roads and ma- make us rethink uh, our car infrastructure and our sidewalk infrastructure. Um, so this doesn't have uh, a whole lot to do with, you know, sort of global food production or, or sort of high, uh, high levels of energy production around the world. Um, but it is to say that the way that technologies are embedded in uh, in our lives and in our in our infrastructure is very is very different from from technology to technology, um, and it's worth sort of learning from these examples uh, how different technologies scale given the different contexts. Yeah, again, no one size fits all. <laughs> um, so I think this leads well into a question from Jenny about. Uh, techno optimism. She asks, have you folks revisited eco modernism lately? Is it still a useful label? I feel like it's become somewhat synonymous with perpetual techno optimism, but it seems like breakthrough has been pretty good about acknowledging the limits of tech along with the positives. Thoughts? Yeah, I think that like all movements or whatever, uh, eco modernism has attracted its fair share of critics who caricature it. Uh, who caricature us at the Breakthrough Institute as sort of techno fetishists or as techno libertarians uh, or as hyper techno optimists who think that technologies like nuclear power are just going to drop in and fix the climate problem or uh, who think that technologies like genetic modification are just going to drop in and fix problems in global agriculture and and, fa- and farm pollution. Uh, that has never been the case. We have always sort of made pains, as, as you and I have been talking about this whole episode, to surface the social and cultural and political elements that go into these big technological transitions and solving these big environmental problems. Um, but as I said, um, it's uh, deal- dealing with those caricatures um, is, is part of the challenge. Um, you know, one of, one of the reasons that we talk about 
eco-modernism as a school of thought and not an ideology uh, and not and, and not even so much a movement is because we want it to be open to multiple possible value sets, to multiple possible politics and to multiple possible futures, uh, whether those are sort of technological or political or whatever. Um, and I think that we do a decent job at that. Um, and I and I hope that the the people who think that we're techno fetishists uh, notice that and, and want to come to the table and talk more. Yeah, I like thinking of it as a verb instead of a noun. Um, I, I studied the history of science and I always love thinking about Bruno Latour, who was one of the, um, original philosophers in that, in that field of study, uh, who, who writes about black boxes and how unproductive it is to put facts and ideas into black boxes because then you just have one black box arguing against another black box, just saying, this is right. No, this is right. Instead of, um, you know, that, that creates such a stagnance and stalemate. And if you open them, then you can have much more nuanced and harder conversations. Like we've been talking about again and again about like, here's the evidence. Here's where I'm coming from. Here's why I even studied this. Here's why I think this is a good solution or why it's worth talking about. Um, and then you can have a lot more enmeshed conversations where you're actually talking to each other. Um, and I think that that's the way that I see breakthrough is um, sort of being like an instigator and a challenger in uh, conventional and traditional environmentalism um, and sort of um, trying to rupture those black boxes a little bit so that we get to start asking those hidden questions inside. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that we and I gravitate towards technological solutions like advanced nuclear reactors and, and smaller modular reactors like plant-based meat, not just because those technologies we think need more funding and investment for innovation and deployment and cultural and social support, but because those technologies sort of shake up our ideological and cognitive and values boxes um, and, and open them up in ways that encourage debate and encourage sort of cross ideological and, and, and cross political discussions. It's, it's why we have this podcast. It's why we have our events. It's why we exist. Yeah, I think that leads really well into this question from River, who asks, what are the topics, technologies and policies that you see as creating the most alignment within and across the climate and clean energy spheres today? And I would just add to that based on the conversation we're having, what topics do you see as um, creating the most shakeup, the opposite of alignment? Yeah, um, you know, like, like I mentioned, uh, I'm particularly drawn towards things like small nuclear because it, it, because nuclear has been a somewhat polarizing technology over the decades. And what's interesting uh, about advanced reactors is that they are not perceived as 20th century, as sort of mega projects built by the government or by some phantom industry. Um, but that we can imagine, uh, as we talked with uh, with Susie Baker on this podcast last year about we can imagine embedding these nuclear at highly advanced scientific technological uh, uh, re uh, reactors um, in our communities in, in different ways. And that and that sort of uh, gets people who are really invested in climate action, gets people who are really invested in uh, in energy innovation gets people really invested in futurism, gets people really invested in urbanism, uh, all sort of talking about the same thing. Um, fake meat, likewise, is really fascinating to me because first it sort of shook up uh, conventional conversations about natural food and elite food. And now th that same conversation is trickling down into grocery stores and into fast food chains in ways that are obviously upsetting people, um, but that are really changing the way we talk about the technological nature of our food um, and are changing the way that we think about environmentally friendly technologies. Um, you know, so, you know, there, there are, there are a bunch of, of examples like that. Obviously, solar power is, uh, is hugely popular, not just because it is a clean energy technology, but because you can kind of pick your favorite solar technology. There's solar panels that fit on your roof. There's solar panels that fit on Ikea. And then there's solar panels that are in huge configurations out in the desert. And those have their different technical and economic benefits and drawbacks to them, um, but are, are sort of, uh, they, they sort of generate a, a cross ideological, cross technical um, conversation about, uh, about these different technologies that is really interesting. So unfortunately, I think that's all the questions from our listeners that we have time for. But I do want to ask you one more question because we make all of our guests answer it. So I want to make you answer it, Alex. What gives you hope? I, I 
I was terrified to answer this question, uh, which is funny because I am a, a techno optimist at the Breakthrough Institute, and I ask this question all the time. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little into left field to answer it. Um, so I, in the rest of my life, I, I co lead a free fitness group here in Oakland called November Project. It's in 51 other cities around the world and growing. Um, in uh, in Wednesday mornings in Oakland and some in some cities and Monday and Friday mornings at 630, dozens of people meet up in their city for free and do 30 to 45 minute workouts together. And why I bring that up and why I say that brings me hope is because in this conversation uh, about uh, bridging ideological divides, about bridging cultural divides, about dealing with things like polarization in an age where we don't have an external enemy that we can we can sort of point uh, our anger and at um and that sort of brings us together as a national uh, as as a national community um and as politics continues to divide us and as things like technology tribalism continue to divide us things like fake meat are getting people really upset um there i think there really is a need and there always will be for community for ritual and for gathering. Um, and that's not always going to be religion like it used to be. It's not always going to be things like rotary clubs, but it needs to be something. Um, and for me, it is this group called November Project, uh, that has really reinvigorated a communitarian ethic in my life. Uh, my guess is most of the people listening to this won't do it, but you know, I think you should do something, um, that gets you out of Twitter, gets you out of your immediate sort of social and ideological bubble. Um, all of the staff at the Breakthrough Institute is very familiar with November Project. It's Alex's favorite subject, but I've never heard it framed quite in that way. It might actually make me vote for the first time. Everyone's welcome. It's free. <laughs> it's for everybody. So with that, I want to thank you for joining me today, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Thanks for tuning in to the Breakthrough Dialogues. We have really enjoyed receiving your questions the last few weeks, and we really hope it won't stop here. Please continue to engage with us. You can always find us on Twitter at the BTI or email us at info at thebreakthrough.org. If you like our show, please rate us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe on whatever platform you're listening. Thank you to our producer, Alyssa Kadaman, and thank you for participating and tuning in. Catch you next time. Thank you.